What's good, y'all? What's good, Real Talk Squad? This is Miles, and you're listening to Real Talk of Miles Johnson, where you know we always keep it real. Let's get straight into We have another special guest. What do I always say? We always bring heavy hitters. Right here, we got Dwayne Carter. This is a special episode, man. We have a the first ever three-time captain at Duke football, all-conference defensive lineman, the Tatum Award winner. That's for the ACC's conference's top scholar athlete, right? He's all ACC first team, Duke MVP. I keep going on, defensive player of the year, the board member for the, you know, student athlete advisor committee. He's the vice boss or vice president for Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated, Root of the Bros, and of course, he is Mr. Duke. Dwayne, welcome to Real Talk with MJ. We appreciate you for hopping on. Man, hey, I don't know if I was deserving of all that, man. That's dope, man. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Um, and I've been seeing you know, your work from you know afar, and you know, I really appreciate uh and just seeing from, from a distance your grind, like your hustle, and you don't have to be like in the building or be in the stands to like see like great work ethic. So you know, it was definitely a pleasure to ha- pleasure to have you on. And really, just what's the day in the life, you know, that you have as somebody who declared for the NFL draft, preparing for the Senior Bowl that's happening in uh, February third. So, yeah, what's your day in the life going on right now? Yeah, man. So that's a good question. It's funny. Um, it's a total one eighty for real from when I was. Well, I said when I was, I was a month ago when I was in school yeah. <laughs> doing all that. But really, so for me, honestly, like this whole quote unquote pro lifestyle switch for me has been crazy, man. So I really get in the building about 8 a.m. I'm out here in L.A. Uh, working out at Proactive Sports. So shout out to the gang. Uh, really great people. Shout out also to Athletes First. I got on some of it. Those are my guys, man. So that's my representation as well. But I really start my days at 8 a.m. We go in, breakfast, uh, a lot of prehab stuff. So stretching. Uh, physical therapy, uh, cold tub, hot tub, a whole bunch of different things, you know, make sure my body's ready to compete and, you know, get better. So then I head to the field after that, and that's all position and combine work, working 40-yard dashes, um, L drills, shuttle drill, like all the different jumps. And when you're on the field too, it's like it's never overkill. Like I think the biggest difference for me, uh, between college and the pro lifestyle so far has been the overkill in college. I mean, mm. in college, you got to work on so much more. Um, you're working, first of all, it's a team focus. So the mental toughness piece, the team building, the chemistry, all this stuff is all about, you know, the greater good. And not to say like, you know, pros are selfish, which I'm not saying that, but when yeah. you're trying to, you know, make yourself the best that you can be, um, it's all about you. And that's what kind of my agency and, you know, everybody's been stressing to me, but at the same time, you know, still being who I am. So yeah, it's been pretty cool with that. And then we hit the weight room after, and then I'm really done around, I think, 2 p.m., 2.30 every day. So it's pretty good life. That's what's up. And is it harder now, given the fact that, um, you know, you definitely have great people around you, but it's also, like, it's all on you. Like, for instance, with when, when you're playing for Duke, you're playing with the, a team. So you can kind of, if, if you aren't, feeling it one day you can rely on your your teammates versus now it's more of you know if I don't want to wake up then that's really like it's all on me so have you faced any challenges you know after you know you declare just after you know your uh, time at Duke yeah that's real and that's a great question well like you said like college like there's always somebody checking up behind you um making sure you go to class you know make sure work is done like you know if you don't show up to practice one day people knocking on your door like where you at calling you all this stuff but at the end of the day, like the pro life starts on you. Like you said, I have a great cast around me. Um, obviously, I have all the resources necessary, all the support necessary. But at the end of the day, if I don't handle business, that's on me. And there's no checking up and everything else because right now I'd just be hurting, you know, myself at the end of the day. So it's really crazy. And difference, I will say, like as far as like the team building and the chemistry and different challenges that I face, um, I think the biggest challenge for me has been like not being around the team. Mm. I mean, I've been merged in team culture for, I mean, not even just college, for as long as I remember. I mean, I've been a sports kid my whole life. So, yeah, I've been submerged in team culture. So now, you know, I'm moving across the country because I'm originally from Ohio and then mm-hmm. going to school in North Carolina. And now I'm literally at the edge of the other side of the United States. Yeah. 
crazy being away, being three hours behind everybody else, and, you know, still trying to keep tabs with everybody, keep up, checking on all my people, make sure everybody's good. I think, honestly, that's been my biggest challenge and, you know, filling the space in those hours where, you know, they're all asleep and, you know, everybody's awake over here. Mm -hmm. And back to, you know, your time at Duke or really like before that, when you got, you know, the call that, you know, Duke wanted you um, and you decide to accept that, uh, what, what, what went behind that decision to commit to, uh, Duke, you know, you were a three-star recruit at, um, at a Pickerington in, in Ohio. So, uh, yeah, what was behind that decision to commit to Duke? Yeah. So that's a great question. I'm getting that question a lot. Uh, yeah. So I think I have a pretty decent answer by now. And it's really, so Duke was one of my first visits. I think it was my first travel visit outside of Ohio, of course. So when I got on the campus, I immediately fell in love from the people um, to the academics, of course, but that's kind of, you know, it just goes unsaid because it's new and that's what it's really known for. But, you know, you talk about a great group around me is that's something I always say. Um, I believe you can never do anything alone. Um, mm -hmm. always say, you know, you need people to rely on and to help you advance in life. And I just immediately felt that when I was down there, um, they introduced me to everything outside of football as well as football, of course, but it was a, academic staff, your counselors, your deans, um, different mental health resources, uh, doctors we had on campus. Like, I was just exposed to everything Duke. And I just remember like leaving campus, I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be. But I try to ignore it for as long as I can, you know, and enjoy yeah. that process that I had dreamed of for so long. But I remember just going on other visits. I'm like, yeah, this is cool. Like I get on the high on it for a second. And then a couple days later, I'm like, man, that's not where I'm supposed to be at. And I always knew like Duke was home after I left. That's what's so I feel that because I'm at NYU now, uh, Morehouse College graduate. So when, when I visited NYU, I knew immediately I was like, yeah, this is where I want to be. But in my head, I'm yeah. like, let me try and like be open minded, not put my eggs in all one basket. But yeah, deep down, I knew from the start, like, yeah, it felt like home. So I feel that for sure. And uh, really, you know, you rested at your freshman year. Um, mm -hmm. How did you adjust to, you know, just frankly not playing? Because, you know, to get to uh, be, you know, a Division One recruit, you have to be basically like the star. You're basically like the star player everywhere you went. Like, you as the man versus now, like, you have to, um, you know, wait your time. So uh, how was that adjustment? And a follow-up to that, what advice do you have for, you know, high school players that, you know, are, you know, looking to go to that division one route and they might have to be in, in, a, in a, a situation like that. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, especially in this day and age, because, you know, if people not playing, they get them out of there <laughs> within the yeah. first couple. Of years. Yeah. So obviously it was a little bit different way back in 2019, which seems like forever now. But for me, I just remember getting there and I had that mindset. I was like, you know what, I'm going to come in, I'm going to play right away. Like, and if I don't play, like, I'm a failure. Like, that literally was my mindset going in, like, because I felt like, you know, I was good enough. Like, I'm a young kid. I didn't know any better. I really didn't understand the game of football as a whole, like I should have, to be able to play at that level, right? And I started off the year. I remember our first game was actually against Alabama in the uh, the Atlanta Superdome. So, it was like, my first college game ever. So, you know, I, I had that circled for since I committed. And I was like, yeah. I'm playing playing that game like it's so not going to play the game we get to win the camp I got a pretty decent camp for you know a freshman and I'll never forget this my coach kind of threw me in there like in the third quarter I played I think maybe like eight snaps like it wasn't anything significant but I played eight snaps and uh they might have won that year I don't know but they had a song team it's when they had like Jerry Judy Jalen Waddle like all the receivers like their squad was not Ooh, yeah. like they had a squad so like you know as a young kid you're like those are guys you looked up to before you got to this level and now I was out there I'm like I'm playing, like, I'm going to do this, like, whatever. Went on, played the first game, a couple snaps. I was like, all right, a little bit of momentum in the week two. Threw me out there again. I'm like, oh, shoot, I really got a shot at this. Like, all right, so, you know, we're going a little bit. And that was when the red shirt rule has first been enacted where you play four games and, you know, keep your red shirt, which oh. at first I was like, man, red shirt, whatever. Like, it's just stupid. But, now nah, I'm forever grateful for it at the end of the day. So I played that second game and, you know, coach kind of sat me down. Next couple of games, I'm like, you know, it's all right. You know, he might be saving me for something big. And then yeah. we had a guy go down, and I had to step up. I played maybe three snaps that game. And after that, I kind of realized, like, what was going on here? Like, it was like a emergency base if I was going to play, but I didn't be able to keep my red shirt. So 
I'm just – I remember going into the season like the rest of the season. I would literally get dressed 10 minutes before we had to run out. I put my helmet on the bench somewhere. Just put on my jersey and pants, go out there and just, you know, be a cheerleader. And that's really what my role was, like a morale guy, high energy guy. And I decided to, like, learn as much as I could. And this is more so towards, like, you know, young athletes who obviously have aspirations to go to the next level and compete at this next level, but not only compete but play and play a memorable role. And for me, it was just learn as much you can. So I found, like, the leaders on the team, the guys who work the hardest, guys who are smartest. And that's not necessarily, like, the big flashy guys who, you know, had the most sacks, most tackles, whatever it may be. But it was the guys who worked the hardest for me and the leaders and got, I saw other guys look up to. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I was like, I called it like just being a sponge. Like, I mean, I soaked up whatever I could information-wise, knowledge-wise, and just went on about it, you know, try to add it and implement my game and learn how to lead by example. Yeah. And you referenced this uh, in the beginning in terms of we're in a day and age now in college football where if a certain player isn't playing, and he's up out of there. And so with you at Duke, you stayed all the whole time you were there. Um, so yeah. what made you stay there? Was there any doubt at some point like, oh, I might look at this direction, this direction, or just what made you stay there through the thick and thin? Yeah, so for me, a big thing for me, I committed to Duke. Uh, I committed to Duke. Obviously, I committed to coaching staff as well. But at the end of the day, I knew Duke was a place for me. Uh, that's where I was going to be able to grow the best. And, you know, IBS is all like seeds at the end of the day. And if you're placed under a tree, you're not going to grow. <laughs> but if you're out there in the sunlight and everything else, getting the water you need to grow, then you'll grow. And that was my garden was Duke, and I knew that. So for me, that was essential for me to go there and, you know, get my degree. First off, I was going to get my degree. Because I will say, uh, rough batch, we went, I think, five and seven my first year. I think we won like a total of five games the next two years. So it was a real rough patch and then went through a coaching change my junior season. And that's when it was like, you know, people started texting you, calling you like, hey, you think about leaving? Everybody hitting you up because I ended up having a pretty decent year. And, you know, I had opportunities to go other places so I could opt in the portal. But like I said, um, Duke was placing me off loader Duke and I also had to get my degree. I mean, I came three years, did all my work everything else, I was going to get my degree before I made any decisions. And that would have been like, maybe I would have grad transferred. I mean, you never know. I'm not going to say I wasn't ever going to transfer, but at the end of the day, that's where I belong. And Coach Elko and his staff came in and we flipped the ship around and ended up having two good years in a row. And how do you feel about like this new shift? And and I'm I'm happy about it Um, where players, you know, are really getting, you know, being able to, treat themselves as like a brand even early on before the pros with NIL. How do you feel about like the emergence of NIL, how it's really, um, you know, taking your know, athletes representation and their overall brand to another level. Um, and, and also do you feel like there's certain instances where it might be overboard? Um, but how do you feel about NIL and just that whole space? Yeah. So first, um, I remember NIL came out, I think it was 2021, July 2021. And me, I was a benefactor of NIL, obviously being a Division One student athlete, but I took advantage of things I could as far as, you know, TikTok stuff, social media revenue posts, different things like that. I didn't really go, like, all into it. And then, uh, you know, as time got on, these collective uh, collectives come about, and that's where, like, the bargaining chip begins. And I think that's why it's so hard for, like, younger athletes, especially high school athletes, because nowadays, like, college teams are just building their rosters based off of, you know, NIL and going to get players they want because they can pay for different players, X, Y, and Z. And I think the coolest thing about me for Duke or about Duke for me, excuse me, was like everybody on that team for the most part, like we had a couple of transfers here and there, but for the most part, like the core group was guys I came in with four or five years ago. And that was like unheard of in college football yeah. nowadays. We were successful, um, obviously. Finished the year at eight and five, I think it was this year. Mm. Injury bug got us. No excuses, of course. No excuses. But, you know, I think we could have shot a little bit higher with it weren't for some injuries. But I think it just goes to show, like, when the team is, like, that old and hung around together for that long, or what you can do. And I think that Michigan team is a prime example of that this year, too, as well, because a lot of those guys were, you know, fourth, fifth, and sixth-year seniors. Yeah. They hung around and built something together. But, I mean, NIL is a great thing, and I think it's a great thing, too, when it's done right. And I don't think guys should chase money unless you absolutely need to, right? And that's the thing for me, because who am I to tell you about your situation? 
uh, mm-hmm. with your family needs, what you need to do. Because even to my teammates before and I was dang, like, I know they were getting their refund checks, sending some money home, helping pay bills, you know, helping get food, whatever it may be. Like, they actually, their family relied on the money they were getting from refund checks and cyber checks, stuff like that. So, yeah, definitely a very good thing. And I think it, I think it can be sustainable, but you know, <laughs> we'll see in the yeah. long run. Yeah, that's a great point because, like you said, it's a lot of athletes that they literally need to, you know, have the, these deals and, you know, really essentially like be like the man of the house for their families. Like if, if they aren't, right. you know, that's getting true. this money, then, you know, their families at a disadvantage. So they got to, you know, leverage their talent and, you know, everything that they're doing um, when they're playing at the high level. Also, uh, in regards to like this season, um, I want to talk about two things. One, uh, when y'all upset Clemson, uh, mm-hmm. how do you feel about that? I was, uh, I was, I was real surprised about that. I was like, oh shoot, dude, coming crazy this year. How do you feel about that game? Man, look, you and every but everybody else is watching the game. Um, it was funny. I don't remember. Part of the reason I came back, because I couldn't declare it last year as well, was because I knew what we had coming back. I mean, we had a solid squad, a great signal color, and we had a lot of experience, better experience in the chemistry. I mean, we played hard, and that jumped off the tape, you know, regardless of out there. We played for each other, and it was true, like, passion on that field and love for the game. So, I mean, watch, I'm like, bro, we got some, We got something special. And I just remember, like, leading up the game, schedule gets released, like, all these. Actually, I think the schedule release was today for the 2024 season as well, but yeah, I remember like we made all these videos kind of in our creative team. Shout out to them. I mean, they're trolls, man. Like, they let us like, <laughs> you know, like eat it, like all this stuff. And we actually did the uh, the dabble run out the tunnel. One of our DBs, like, we had him like we hit our rock, whatever, and he did the dabble run, like the sprint, whatever. So yeah. it was a troll. And I'll literally never forget this, like, because that was one of the most active tweets I've ever seen on our football page ever. Yeah. And people, Oh, you guys are gonna figure out uh, September, whatever. Like, you guys don't know. You guys just poked the bear, woke the beast, all this stuff. And yeah, you know that motivation. Like, cause I knew what we had. I knew that we had. Everybody knew it. And I just remember, like, coming to fall camp that first practice. You just knew, like, oh yeah, we got a squad. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, when you on the team, you know it's good. Like, you just know, and you just knew. So, I mean, we got to flying around, practicing, and you know, just getting better each day. And it was all about proving us right too. And I will say, like, kudos to. Coach Echo and his mantras because at the end of the day, our mindset was always about us. We weren't worried about, like, you know, what the opponent has or who's on their team or whatever draft picks. You know, whatever the case may be, it was always yeah. about us, what we could do to play our best. And that was our mindset going every week. And we're always trying to prove ourselves right. And it wasn't about, you know, proving the doubt is wrong, proving the head is wrong, or, like, trying to upset whoever. It was just about us. And, you know, we got the job done, man. So that was crazy. Uh, a field storm, and it's pretty dope. Now – uh, you had a great moment against UConn where you had a scoop and score. So, you know, obviously, like, we have, you know, in football, it's common for the the running backs, the wide receivers, but I always love when the defense gets their moment because they be the ones really, you know, in the trenches getting stuff done, but you don't necessarily see them get they shine. So when you got that scoop and score touchdown, how do you feel? I know you was I know you was going crazy. Man, look, so this was so crazy because I will say, like, my team, I was like most hated in the sense that like they say I'm like the luckiest player. Like they'd be like, y'all get the luckiest, like whatever. Cause it happened last year. We played A and T uh two seasons ago. Same thing. My boy made a strip shack. Actually, my trade dog made a strip shack. And I just happened to be right in front of the ball, bounced right up to the ticket to the house. So I was like, they were like, no way. So I never forget the UConn game because actually I was the last one to the ball. Like crazy enough, like the way they filmed the clip, like it looks like I'm right here in position. But it literally was when my tray, he broke through the line, kind of stood up a little bit. He slipped off, and actually my five dog came in and finished it. Ryan Smith the DN came in, boom, knocks the ball out. And I never forget this. Like this never happens. The ball fell just like this, and stuck like in the ground. Uh-huh. So of course, like me, I'm coming to you know finish the play a little bit. And I'm running around the corner, ball sticks. I'm like, free run to the end zone. I said, but no way. 
So it's funny, like in the film clip I got, they sent us our clips after every year. You can hear like the guys on the side, like, bro, no way. This is crazy. I can't believe him. Of course. Like, it was so funny. But like, you know, it was a little bit of hate, but it was all love. It, yeah. It was that's cool. funny. That's funny. Uh, what's it called? No, that's definitely great for the for the defense to get they shine. Um, and man, they call you Mr. Duke because you be doing everything, whether it's on the field, off the field, like you're the man. And I asked Monet Davis this question actually like when I interviewed her, when it's like when you're getting a lot of love, you know, everybody's telling you how awesome you are. Um, like how do you keep yourself level headed and still hungry for more? Cause this isn't all that you want to do, or you know, you still have other goals, you know, aside. So how do you uh in the midst of you know all the love, everybody congratulating you being like, Oh, I'm just getting started, like you know, I, I still have way more, way more else to give. Yeah, I think the cool thing about this is uh one of our coaches, Coach True. He was my coach, yeah, my whole career, one of them. He's a running backs coach. And he always says, like, never let your circumstances take your standard. Let your standard take your standard change your circumstance, excuse me. And it's kind of funny, like you think about it, we all make fun of him for like we call him this troopism. So he has a whole bunch, but like that one specifically, like it's, it's a standard. And for me, uh, coming to school, I literally had this as a goal um as an 18-year-old was to leave a legacy. And it wasn't a legacy in like itself, it's where I'm gonna have like the most sacks, I'm gonna be the best player ever. Like, of course, like that was my goal. But like my goal was leading Lacey and impact the campus in a positive way, right? And leave a place better than I found it, which was, you know, another motto of our program that Coach Cut had. And, you know, I still live by it to this day. And so when it's just your standard to do right, then you know, do something for the right reason. I don't think it's ever for any praise or, you know, the claps or maybe the accolades that you get or whatever else comes with it. For me, it's just, I think, just being a good person, doing the right thing is what will continue to drive that, especially, you know, in this day and age when being a good person is almost a lost art. <laughs> it's a lot of yeah. bad and mean people in this world, you know, who don't really care about others and how to disregard, you know, whether it's social status, uh, race, ethnicity, social class, like whatever it may be, like it's just, it's just not enough good in the world. And that's kind of where my mindset comes from and where my frame is. So, you know, saying like be where your feet are, like wherever my feet are, I try to impact people the most positive way I can. And, you know, we're all friends. And mom always told me, you know, respect everybody mm. and to us, well, treat everybody the way you want to be treated. So that's like, you know, two morals. And, and that's kind of how I shape myself today. And I think that's really where all that stemmed from. Yeah. And I, I would definitely say, uh, you know, it shows the way you carry yourself, the impact that your parents had on you their values something that you said your dad um you know tells you frequently is attitude and effort and yep. control control what you can control so when you, you know those two words attitude and effort and how do you apply those not only on the field but as well as off the field too yeah so that's real um i think sports are really a microcosm of life like you know everybody turns them on white people are around just hit people, um, you know, watch people dribble ball, watch people shoot a ball on a goal, like whatever it is, like it's just simple. But when you're actually involved on a team and like you're in a team, like you learn so many skills and it's just a lot of times unintentional of teamwork, togetherness, um, unselfishness, uh, unselfishness, excuse me, being selfless, like all these different tools and everything else. So at the end of the day, if you go through life with a positive attitude, that's all you can control. Like, obviously, you're going to have bad days here and there and bad stuff's going to happen, but you can't, you know, control the bad things that happen to you for the most part. Like, obviously, you make some bad decisions. But at the end of the day, if you focus on what's in front of you and you wake up saying, like, today I'm going to have a good day. Today I'm going to walk out. I'm going to impact somebody today. Today I'm going to make somebody smile. Today I'm going to smile at somebody. Today. Like, you know, small little goals. All that stuff adds up. So I've taken that literally my whole life since whenever he started shooting, man, forever ago. It's just that motto is applied, obviously, on the field in a different way, but off the yeah. field, it's, it's just that that's the thing for me, you know, little by little, you don't have to do anything, you know, crazy, but you never know what you could do end up changing somebody's life. And especially off the field, um, there was a point where, you know, you had to really, you know, stand up and be a leader, you know, with your team when, you know, it was, uh, 
you know, the Black Lives Matter and, you know, a lot of, you know, social justice. Mm-hmm. And there's still always happening today. Like, it's not like it's over. Um, right. But uh, especially like during that time with the protests and all that, and, you know, you, you know, use your voice to you know, speak on how you felt about everything that was going on. So why was it important for you to speak up for, you know, Black Lives Matter, for the social justice issues that, you know, me and you face and people that look like us face um, and do that kind of unapologetically. Yeah. So first of all, I mean, I think it just stems from, like you said, uh, these are things we face uh, daily. Um, it's honestly, you know, <laughs> it is what it is at this point, but yeah. you got to do it and to affect change, right? And educate. I think the biggest thing for me is the education piece and uh, the way it all lined up. I remember coming into Duke, I had planned to be a physical therapist. Like I was on the track, everything. And I remember taking my first class in one of the courses that was required. <laughs> and I got like an F minus. It was bad, bro. I got like 40%. So I was like, yeah, you know what? It's not for me. Like, whatever. I'm going to go on about it. Flat forward, second semester of that year, um, the pandemic hits. We're sent home. Social justice hits. George Floyd's murder. All this other stuff starts happening. Other murders, hate, divide. Uh, you looking at people you grew up with. Um, seeing their true colors, how they really mm-hmm. feel. On and you're like, okay, like that's how really how you feel. Like I grew up with you. Like you slept over my house. Like you fed me. I fed you. Like stuff like that. You really think like this is really how y'all feel. Like, and a lot of those comments I feel like were made out of ignorance, specifically to the demographic that I'm speaking to. Um, there was a lot of ignorance. People didn't know. So that's kind of really what filled my past for education. Because I myself, I mean, I don't know everything. By any means, don't know everything. But I remember that summer, I took initiative to educate myself, uh, teach myself about our history, which is American history as well, and really learn, you know, at least some of the key stuff that I need to know and continue to seek information and have conversations with people who know more than me. And that's another thing. I'm always ready to learn. I want to learn, especially about issues like this. So going to that, I remember bringing it back to school. Um, I was a sophomore, so I was still a young guy, like fresh off of, that season, and guys were like, listen, like, we're going to boycott practice because we feel like uh, the coaching staff is kind of just breathing through this issue, you know, like, it was something like that. So, they were not to boycott. I remember getting out of this FaceTime call. So, I was like, hey, like, what do you think about this? So I was like, all right, like, kind of respect. Like, they kind of view me as a leader, I guess. So, you know, I gave my little two cents, bam. So, long story short, we boycott practice, don't show up. Like, we're going to do, like, it was a kneel for nine, and it was the – we had a march as well from the football building to the chapel on campus, which isn't very far, but we did it together as a team. Um, kudos to our staff. They joined us. They heard us out. They wanted to hear, you know, what we had to say and how we felt. And they gave us that platform and forum to express ourselves. So I remember we got to the chapel, though. Um, we kind of got there, and it was kind of like, all right, like, looking around, like, what's next? <laughs> and I remember 19-year-old me, I'm like, and one thing about me, I hate, like, silence and waiting. Like, I'm that guy in class. Like, nobody know the answer. I'm going to say something. Like, you can say so. That's just how I am. So I remember I literally just hopped to the front and kind of spoke from my heart and out there and said what I said. And I think that I earned a lot of respect from not only, you know, the team and the staff, but, you know, administration and everything else was aware. And they kind of knew where I felt like, and I kind of spoke to that. And, you know, my emotions, my feelings, what I was feeling, what I had learned just everything like that and we ended up walking back and I kind of was in the front of the walk like you know alongside my teammates just going back on and then we started a uh, forum in our indoor as well where it was like open floor guys speak on how they feel um, different guys shared different accounts they had with police uh, different racial issues they face um, and it was white and black so it was like and that's why our team is so close as well it's a rare rarity but I think that was really big for us so for me like I think just me being brave and stepping out, encourage a lot of other guys, especially older guys, to step out, you know, speak their mind, speak their truth and what they were feeling. I think from that point on, like, I was like, all right, I think this bad guys called me to be on. It's education. Because that's where I feel like I really impacted the team the most. Mm-hmm. And that's from, like, obviously I want to be a ball player, a really good ball player. But at the end of the day, like, I'm worried about impacting and changing people's lives. And that's really my mission. That's dope. And, you know, you graduated, you know, Duke with, you know, a bachelor's degree in psychology with a minor in education and 
Feeder. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Do my little, you feel me? Do my little research, you mean? So um uh but yeah, back to education. Um uh you touched on it. Uh what's so powerful about you know education, especially in a time where there's a lot of misinformation on you know certain stuff. Um, you know, I obviously in an age where there's a whole lot of stuff on social media, some of it's true. A lot of it is not true. Uh, what's the importance of education to you? Yeah, so it's a loaded question uh, for many reasons. And at the end of the day, the saying knowledge is power is real. And I kind of equated this on uh, my grandfather on my mother's side. He always tell me, well, they didn't take a lot of stuff from you, but your birthday? And he just say that every time on my birthday. And I'm like, he's kind of be joking. I'm like, kind of serious. And the older I got, like, they can't take what you learn. I got my degree, like I graduated. They can't take that from me. And they can be, you know, many different people in a lot of different contexts. But, you know, ideas of education and race, everybody knows who they has been for a while. Mm -hmm. But I digress on that. But at the end of the day, knowledge is power. And I feel like the more you know, the more you grow, right? And if you don't know any better, you can't do better. And that's why it's so important coming up. Like, we're taught right for the first time. So if you're taught right, then what do you do? You pass it on and you pass it on and pass it on. And I had a actually history teacher in seventh grade and he asked us a question, a simple question. He's like, why do we even learn history? And, you know, we all confused. Like, what do you mean? Like, you don't want to learn this boring. Like, nobody cares about this. Like, we learn about mm -hmm. like, the empires and different things. Like, nobody cares about this. Like, that's yeah. what we were feeling. And he was like, so it doesn't repeat itself. And it's funny, all these life lessons that I've gotten over the years are starting to resurface or have started to resurface through my college years, specifically that one. Because if you look like, stuff just keeps repeating itself, uh, issues, racial issues, uh, gaps, wealth gaps, wage gaps, and it's not just race, it's gender, like all these different things just continue to repeat themselves and cycle. And I think the biggest indicator of that ignorance to us as a nation was that 2020 era was like, people are speaking on something, I'm like, that's not even correct. Like, you don't really know the history of that. Or, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of simple history and Black figures that we know growing up or we're taught growing up, other people didn't know. And that's coming out to us, but it's foreign to other people. They'd be like, oh, you were treated like this? I didn't know this. Oh, you can't do this with the police, but I can do this. Like, no, it's just, if you don't come together and learn each other's experiences and lived experiences, that's where the issues come, in my opinion. So that's kind of where my passion really came from was learning that, you know, break down these boundaries and barriers and just share knowledge and information. Now, if you have the information, you still choose to be wrong and not be right by it. That's your own choice. And, you know, I think that's just innate evil in you. But at the end of the day, I feel like most reasonable people, no matter what end of the political spectrum you are, like race, whatever it is, like if you know something wrong morally and you're a good person, you'll act accordingly. And so that's kind of the biggest thing for me, man. And I just remember thinking back to all these different situations and, I had many conversations with black, white, Hispanic, you know, Asian, like whatever it be, just many different people of me learning from their, them and them learning from me as well. It's not like I know everything. Like I said, I don't know everything, but they taught me so much. And I feel like I taught them as well, just from, you know, being willing to have that conversation or them feeling comfortable enough to me, ask me a question like, all right, how do you feel about this issue? What is it? How do you guys face this? Like, how have you dealt with this? Like, you know, just different things like that. So I think, education really like knowledge is truly powerful because it came on the world in the sense of you know relationship building and stuff like that and you said african american history is american history and when we really you know shift the mindset of being like nah it's not separate from like the true history like you know the mainstream history like no this is all american mm -hmm. history and kind of changing that mindset you know, I believe is that next step of, you know, of stuff being taught in schools about, uh, you know, different like leaders and civil rights movement that everybody knows the MLKs, Malcolm X's, but like, you know, how about go a little bit deeper, you know, than just them and, you know, all the other inf influential people. So, you know, I love that point too. And, you know, back to l l leadership. Right. Uh, back to leadership. You were a the first ever three time captain in Duke football history. Um, what does being a leader 
mean to you and you know how do you lead others yeah so that's a great question um for me i'll speak kind of like the how piece first because i think that it really incorporated really helped me get across what i'm trying to say because for me leadership is not a one-size-fits-all and i think leadership first starts with relationships um we all know like if you don't know nobody and he's trying to you know yell at you or tell you to do something you're like who are you like yeah i don't like there's no common ground like we have broke no bread like yeah there is nothing you can tell me to do because well like, i'm a grown man like whatever like you know just stuff like that and so i remember when i got voted captain 2021 was the first year that was a big year for me relationship wise um i just remember i just made a point to, you know hang out with guys get to know them and I just, you know, know people's names, which is not easy to know a hundred and something people's name on the team, which yeah. first, because if you go into the locker room, I'm pretty sure like not everybody knows everybody's name. Yeah. And I think that's very important for me to, you know, at least know somebody's name and then know a little bit about their family, where they're from, you know, what they like to do, stuff like that, and kind of build and break that barrier a little bit and kind of establish common ground. And that's the other thing I feel like a lot of times leadership is not, you don't really – they always say like leaders can't lead from the back. You always gotta lead in front, like all that stuff. And although I agree with that, but a lot of times like you're linked up arm in arm, this coincide, and we're going out to battle together. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we all have the same training, we all face the same things. Now I will say like leadership obviously in front is definitely necessary. But at the end of the day, you're battling alongside one another. It shouldn't feel like, all right, I'm up here, you guys are down here, so I'm the boss. Like, I've never viewed leadership like that. And I think leaders should do our bad leaders. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a hierarchy just based off of titles, stuff like that. But that's for me, like, it's not just a one size fits all. You're kind of walking together arm in arm, trying to figure stuff out together, you know, valuing everybody's input. But if it's on you to make a decision, you make the decision. But you don't just make a decision based off of your own tuition. You base it off of the team and what's best for the team as a whole no matter how this guy feels, this guy feels like at the end of the day, the team is the main priority. So I think honestly being like captain, especially the first three time captain of Duke is a huge honor for me. And that's my favorite honor I've ever received just in the sense that my teammates, I feel like really recognize my work and, you know, my intentionalism about getting to know them and being the best teammate that I can be. And that's kind of going along with the attitude and effort piece, because I try to come in every day in the building, big smile, good attitude, ready to work. You know, no matter the circumstances, it'd be a 5 a.m. team run. Like, it'd be a 6 a.m. workout, whatever it is. Like, I feel like I show up ready to go and, you know, just try to uplift others and really lead by example is another one for me. Um, I'm a big vocal guy as well, which you probably never see through a lot of videos. I talk a lot. Yeah. But I also feel like for me to just not just talk, I got to do and say I'm winning reps. Like, competition, I'm giving them my all. I'm out there leading the pack, jogging to wherever we got to go. Like, just stuff like that is something I'm really intentional about. Because I wanted guys to know, like, this is the standard that I wanted the team to play at at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And if you want to see something act, or excuse me, if you want to see something done a certain way, you have to be that way. You can't just give it lip service and just talk. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how I modeled my leadership as well. And that's just really how we were built to in our program. Yeah. Uh, want to shift gears. You know, we both share something uh, very dear to my heart. You got it right here. Rule the brass. Uh and so yeah, really, man, just you know what uh made you, you know, want to pursue Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated. Yeah, man. So I crossed into our beloved fraternity in the spring of 2022 alongside seven of my greatest friends. And I think that's one of the coolest pieces. So coming up, my mom. Is a member of Alpha Cap Alpha Sorority Incorporated, and my dad he's not great. He said he said he's a part of me five me. <laughs> that's what he said. <laughs> so you know that that's kind of me and my mom thing. But I just remember coming up. Uh, my mom went to Ohio State, and I grew up in Ohio, obviously. So we were always on the yard, I'm around yard shows like Greek fest, homecoming, like, stuff like that. I was always immersed <laughs> into the culture yep. of Greek. And then my mom obviously loves she loves her AKA. So I've always been around. Now, when I got to school, uh, it was my freshman year and then COVID pandemic. And I just remember we started talking about it because four guys on my line of legacies. Funny mm -hmm. enough, it's crazy. So, like, the way we lined up, like, every other guy's legacy out of our eight, which is crazy. So, just, you know, being around them, 
their people, uh, their fathers, see how they act, how they work, the service, and really the friendship that really was there kind of, you know, drew me to it. And then I started talking to my guys, you know, these were my, these were my guys before the frat, but, you know, whole different type of friendship now. Yeah. But, you know, we had these conversations like, well, you know, y'all been thinking about joining the Greek fraternity, like, being D9, like, what would y'all be like, you know, conversations grow. Mm-hmm. And attend that first meeting, I think the rest is history, man. And it was, you know, I'm forever grateful. I think the principles of a fraternity are like, kind of how I like to live my day every single day. And I think that's the coolest thing for me too, because it just, it just matched up so well. And I feel like that was one for me. And, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have great brothers who led me in the fraternity as well. Yeah. And look, I'm, it's 2024 now. It's crazy. Like, I don't, and I'm getting kind of old, you know? <laughs> you crossed, uh, was it 22? Yeah. Yep. In the spring? Yep. That's a bet. We, uh, we, uh, Sands. <laughs> Do the bros, man. But I, you know, I like uh, just hearing stories about you know bros that you know their dad wasn't you know the bros. Because I feel like my dad was the bros, my uncle, my grandpa. So it was always in me. I was like, if I was to ever do it, it wasn't even no question. It wasn't even yeah. no no question. But I think it's definitely. It's definitely special, and you, you, you know, it's definitely special to, you know, to do it when you don't even have like a legacy, because it's like, well, I don't even have anybody that, um, I, I, I wouldn't say anybody, but a direct person like in my family that I'm like, oh, you know, that's what I want to model myself after. I, I always thought myself like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do what my dad did, and then, yeah. but I did, I did have to get to a point where it was like, I gotta. I got love for myself. I, you gotta I got make that. Myself. I got love for myself. Like you can, you can only, you, know, you can only see it through it if if you love it for yourself, for real. Okay. So, uh, that's what's up, man. And uh, going back to the, uh, you know, draft and you know, and all that. Uh, you know, what are you looking most forward to? Um, you know, when it comes to you know. You know, draft day and you know, God willing, get that call and all that. What you are uh, looking most forward to when you make that jump to the to the league? Yeah. So, man. So it's funny because like I keep saying like, I'm gonna take it day by day. Like you know, I'm not trying to skip these steps. You know, I always put my best forward. But that question and that thought is always in the back of my head because I worked very hard for this. Uh, it's been a lot of years, and you know, to really have a chance to realize this dream here in less than, well, really two months, I think it is now, but it's just crazy, and crazy time for me. I think the coolest thing for me, though, because I was talking about a village, and I've been talking about my village, and everybody who really, you know, walks alongside me and helps push me to get me to whatever that next level may be, um, I'll finally be able to realize that dream for them, and you talk about, like, what's your why, and my why always stems from that, like, the amount of people who bought into me and, you know, contributed to my success and helped me grow as not only athlete, but a person as well, is a number I couldn't even really count in my head. And I just want to continue to excel and push myself to the limits and make it to the highest I can go. Uh, well, that's, you know, now taking the highest levels in the NFL. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, you get, you know, everybody's saying you want to become a Hall of Famer as well, but I'm, I'm just worried about getting the league before I get yeah. there. Yeah. But then, hey, man, that's what it's about for me, is finally realizing that dream for them and, Continue putting my best foot forward because that's they always say the work begins once you're in. <laughs> so yeah, that's, when that's dope. That's dope. And uh, in relation to regarding your game, um, as as a D tackle, like you said something that really stuck with me. Um, in an interview you had, you said. It might not be the first move I put on somebody, but that second move is gonna work because I want it more. Uh, I feel like that, you know, really, you know, is, is a testament to your work ethic and you know your drive to succeed. So, yeah, when you hear that, uh, and when you said that, actually, apologies. What does that mean? Man, um. So we talk about it's kind of a philosophy, actually. So shout out my position coach, Coach Jeff Simpson, uh, last year. I'm a rigging for a game. 
And I kind of stole from him. He talked about because he used to coach in the NFL, he coached the Falcons, coach B line of the Falcons. And he always talked about, I think he called six second rushes. And it's always like, you know, you're the best of the best. You're not just going to dupe somebody in the first move every time. Like it's going to be yeah. rare. You know, the first move. And it's all about that second move and keep rushing and countering to, you know, eventually get home on the quarterback. So, you know, it's the same mantra. It's just the attitude and effort along with the passion um, because that stuff doesn't happen unless you really want it and you really enjoy it and you really love it. And so when you're – as a pass rush, you got to be relentless. I mean, my other position coach, Coach Albert, always says, like, we were hunting the most intelligent species in football, which, which is the quarterback, <laughs> right? You're not going to get no species down if you're not intelligent as well, but relentless and, you know, tenacious in our pursuit of the ball. So I think that's just – kind of that where that mantra comes from and all the training, everything that I go through where I went through with my team, you know, to get out there on the field and prepare for battle. So that mindset will, you know, forever be the same because I think it works and you can't, talent cannot work hard work. Yeah, that is a hundred percent facts. Got a couple more questions. Uh, you know, this season or last season, rather y'all were in a shootout against, North Carolina, you know, and Drake May, who uh, you know is going to be slated to be a top ten pick, um, really probably like top five pick uh, in the draft. Uh, well, what was it like playing against him, and in that overall game? I mean, you talk about was it overtime, like 40, 47, 45? Like, walk me through that. Yeah, thinking back, first of all, that one still hurts. You know, that one still yeah. hurts. But I just remember going that week, everybody counted us out. We're on our third string quarterback, 18 year old true freshman, Grayson Loftus. Kid's a stud, by the way. And I think he showed everybody that because, you know, in my opinion, he went blow for blow with Drake May, who's, like you said, top five, probably top three mm -hmm. <laughs> pick in the draft. So he went blow for blow with him. But it's just a whole different game plan. I mean, he's talented. He can sling it, of course. His deep ball is always on point. Like he didn't really miss any deep balls in the game. And a lot of people don't give him, I feel like, enough credit for his athleticism. He can run. He's fast. He's elusive. He's hard to bring down if you don't really square him up. And he made a lot of plays. When the game was on the line, he made plays. Um, and we're pressuring him, beating no line up, up front. He's not trying to make throws. He's getting tackled, spun around, keeps eyes on the field, leading receivers, making plays. I'm like, all right, like, this kid's legit. Like, he can really play ball. So, you know, it's just one of them, like, game-recognized game type thing. It was a respect thing. And, you know, at the end of the day, they may put more plays than we did to win the game. But it definitely was like, he's a very talented dude, and he'll do well. Nice, nice. Uh, then my last question, you know, when you survey the league this year, this could either be, you know, players that are vets or new players, but there any players right now that you're looking – looking up to or, you know, looking at like, oh, yeah, you know, game, recognized game. I, I love you know, their work ethic, how they, you know, you know, really like tackle each, you know, each game. Uh, are there, you know, a list of players or a couple of players that you look at and you really appreciate their game? Yeah. So, like you said, game, recognized game. And this year we watched a lot of NFL film uh, during the season. That's another thing our coach loved to do that, watch film, you know, show us how the pros work and how they move and what they do to be successful. So I just remember, obviously, Aaron Donald is number one on the list. He jumps off of everybody's list. And that's just him. He's a technician. He's very precise with his hands. He's relentless. He's quick. Like, he does everything. He want to be in a D tackle. And the same thing with a lot of guys. I watched, like, Kenny Clark. Same thing, the way he went out of the stack last week in that playoff game was ridiculous. Dude was hunting, whether it's pass rushing, stopping the run. He's running down the field, making plays. He's chasing screens. Him and Rashawn Gary were chasing um, – who did they play? Niners? Yeah, chasing McCaffrey around all day. Yeah. Like, whoever it was with the ball, they were running, flowing to the ball. Same thing with Quentin Williams. He's so precise with his hands. He's powerful. He's strong. And another one, obviously, Dexter Lawrence had a year this year. Um, he was a ball player, so we watched a lot of tape on him. And – Christian Wilkins, I don't think he gets enough credit, in my opinion, either. Big disruptor, athletic, fast, quick. And you can tell, like, he loves the game of football. Like, all his mic'd ups are hilarious. Like, he's really just out there having yeah. fun. Yeah. Like, he's trash for playing the game the right way, the way it's supposed to be played. So, you know, those are a couple that's just off the top of my head. But, you know, those are some of the guys that we watched this year, and I watched specifically and just, you know, admire the way they play. That's what's up, bro. And I know uh, you're going to look back at this and – uh 
four years, five years, or whatever, three years, and it's going to be another young gun that's going to be like, yeah, I like to model my game after Dwayne Carter, bro. So, man, I really appreciate you for uh, just hopping on here and uh, taking the time out of your extremely, extremely busy schedule. Something just popped in my mind, another question, uh, because we have the uh, Reese Senior Bowl that's coming uh, you know, on February 3rd. Um, and obviously I know you want to, you know, impress, um, the NFL scouts. Um, but I guess, how do you balance or do you balance it at all? Uh, putting your, your best foot forward, you know, impressing the scouts while also realizing, um, I don't want to, you know, get myself injured or, you know, put myself in harm's way. Is there, is, is it hard to, you know, balance the two or is it more just like, shoot, I'm out there playing. If it happens, it happens. Yeah, I say it's more so the second one because one, I think when you if you're worried about out there getting hurt, you know, playing kind of scared and timid, that's when injuries and stuff happen because you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And you know, you play this game your whole life, so you know, God forbid, you get injured, stuff like that. It's a part of the game, so you can't really sit there and worry about that. But everything else, it's like really is the biggest job interview of my life in terms of like mm. really a three month interview and the uh, start of the process is when I leave to go here soon and I did a mobile and I mean it starts soon I get up the plane and you can't really worry about all the extra stuff you just got to focus on you know yourself and you know trust your ability because at the end of the day like you're not there by accident like you're good enough to be there like you're being with the best of the best and you know your stuff is enough and obviously if you get complacent though and you've been sitting around not working which I haven't <laughs> just to make that clear I haven't you know I've been working and for this moment as well but you're meant to be there. So, you know, I'm just trusting my stuff, ready to go, uh, show who I am and being myself. I'm not trying to be anybody else. I'm not trying to be, you know, anybody but myself. That's who I am. That's who I'm always going to be. So that's kind of my mindset going into it. I love that. This is the uh, biggest job interview, heck of a job interview uh, you better have. And I'm going to be rooting yeah. for you, bro. And, uh, yeah, root of the bros, man. I really appreciate you for hopping on. Root dog, man. Appreciate you having me, for real. Well, y'all, it's Real Talk and MJ with Dwayne Carter for a special, special episode. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. I'm going to uh, drop down his Instagram link. Go show him some love and all of that. And it's one of the young stars about to turn, tear the league by storm. Y'all heard it here first. Y'all going to watch this and be like, yeah, yeah, no, no. You know, Miles was right. Miles was right. But yeah, appreciate y'all. All love.